Excellent. Yeah, thank you guys for inviting me here to your wonderful city, to this wonderful country. I'm so happy to be here getting to visit with all of you about one of my favorite things in the world, which is making video games. How many of you make games for a living? Raise your hands, yeah? Okay, good, I like that. That's what I do also. And they put some letters on my title, and, uh, and, and, and that's great. Uh, but really, I'm a game designer, okay? So uh, what I wanna talk about today is the topic that is most interesting to me in the world, which is how to create toys, games, that make people so excited that they want to play them, that they want to play them with their friends every day for years at a time, okay? That's the thing I want to talk about and visit with all of you about and get your ideas on. So, uh, quick background. Uh, I have been making games professionally for 25 years and I've been making games uh, for some years before that uh, as well. And I've worked on um, a number of different games. I've worked on shooters and I've worked on golf games and I've worked on role-playing games and I've uh, created drinking games and, uh, and games of all types. And what I do these days is I run a company called Kabam. And how many of you guys have played a Kabam game? Excellent, well thank you, I hope you like them. I've been with Kabam about six years now. Uh, some of our, our games that are best known, uh, Marvel Contest of Champions, is one that is well known. Uh, we've got a game called Transformers Forge to Fight. We just released a brand new game called Shop Titans that just came out uh, a few months ago in which you play a shopkeeper uh, in a fantasy world and you create things and sell them to people and with your friends and all of that. And at Kabam, we are focused on entertaining the world. And my goal for this company is I want one billion people to have loved our games. And at that point, maybe as a toy maker, I will then feel like I have done something good for the world and I will be satisfied. Okay, so let's talk about how I, how I think about doing these things. So let's see. Um, I want to talk about how to get people to love you. That's the only really interesting thing in the world is how to get people to care about your game. Because we live in a world now with unlimited free entertainment. If you were to go onto YouTube and start watching videos. However old you are today, you would be dead long before you had seen even a tiny fraction of them, and you would never have to pay a penny. And if you wanted to try and go read great books, the same, or watch movies, the same. We live in a world of unlimited free entertainment, and the only truly hard thing is to get anyone to care very much about that thing that you have built, okay? I wanna talk a little bit about uh, how you attract users in the first place. This is hugely difficult, particularly in the mobile space, uh, and many of the sessions today, and I think tomorrow, will talk about uh, cost per install and many of these things. I wanna talk about the initial engagement, how you get people to care once they've downloaded your game. I'm, I'm pretty focused today on mobile games. That's where I spend all of my attention these days, because that's where all of the users are, right? The entire world, has consoles in their pockets these days. So uh, though I spent 10 years making games for consoles and PCs, I'm pretty focused on mobile uh, and secondarily the PC market right now. So everything we talk about is going to be pretty broadly applicable to those two. A little bit less so to, um, to the, the console market and to the $60 retail game, which frankly is just not enough of a business here or anywhere else in the world for me to be that interested in it anymore. Don't, don't tell EA. Let's talk a little bit about how to get users interested in the first place. The very first thing I think about is, how do you take a game, how do you make a game that the whole world will care about? This is hard because tastes in culture and in entertainment are a little bit different from country to country, from person to person even. So that's the very first thing to think about. Uh, and there are, there are a lot of ways you can do this. There are licenses that you can apply. We just heard about uh, a little bit about what it would be like to work with celebrities. That's a way of getting people's attention. Uh, but it's very hard to find licenses that appeal to the whole planet. I've been fortunate enough to get to work with some, Marvel as an example, Transformers from Hasbro as another example, who do have relatively global appeal. But that's a difficult thing with a license. So that's one way to do it. You, you can build your own intellectual property. You can build your own IP. But this is very difficult, this is challenging because it takes a long time. 
And it's extremely challenging to build new IP that does appeal to the whole world. There are some, though. So uh, a person should not lose heart. You should just think very carefully about what the elements of that intellectual property are that, that will appeal globally. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more in a minute, but I suggest that this has a lot to do with appealing to universal values, interests, and above all, fantasies. Our job as creators is to allow people to experiment with and to enjoy fantasies for things they could never do in real life. So there are some of those things that in every culture, in every country, and many age groups uh, are universally appealing. So I think that's something you can think about. When you think about culturalization, there are a lot of people who talk a lot about this topic and how you uh, take a game and, and make it highly relevant by customizing the, the artwork or similar. I will say that I do not generally believe in that, okay? I think this is kind of like trying to turn a boat into an airplane. Ultimately, either you can build something that appeals to humanity, appeals to the world at large by giving them stories that they can relate to, hero's journey, that kind of thing, or you can build something that is culturally specific to a particular market, but I think it is very difficult, once you have done that, to retrofit and make it appeal to other markets. I think it's interesting to watch some of our friends in Korea and China try and do this right now as they bring Three Kingdoms themed fantasy RPGs to places like India, where those particular fantasies, that particular history, doesn't have huge resonance. So I think often, personally, I don't actually believe in culturalizing products for a particular region uh, very much. I think you should try and build things that have global appeal instead. I think that cross-border play is a huge and interesting consideration when thinking about your games. So let me give you an example. If we were to release a game tomorrow morning where people could play with their friends online and they could run around, and maybe it's a MOBA and maybe it's a shooter, it doesn't really matter. My point is, do you segment the audience so that they are sharded effectively and can play only with people in their country? Or do you allow them to play with the whole world? There, there are really good arguments for both, it turns out, right? And so if you look at something like, um, oh, there, there are a bunch of examples, I don't have to tell you guys, you already know them, but I can release uh, on a server that's just for Indonesia, for example, or just for India if I want to. That's not the approach we've taken. Instead, we have said, no, one world, one game. Let everyone in the world play and make friends with people around the world. And this is difficult for some reasons, some of them technical, most of them other reasons having to do with pricing or similar, but uh, I think it's a question that as game makers you should ask, how you want to think about cross-border play. I think that, um, that, uh, that cross-play is an interesting question as well. You know, I, I look at Fortnite, and the reason Fortnite dazzles me and shows me the way of the future is that Fortnite is a game that you can play with your same account, with your same friends, on a whole bunch of different devices. It's device agnostic. I suspect the whole world is moving that way soon because ultimately what I want to do is I want to walk around and I want to play my game with my friends on my phone and when I get home, if I'm lucky enough to have a big fancy TV, I want to be able to immediately set my phone down, throw it up on the TV, and there I am playing with my friends, with my same characters, with my same progression and all of that. And then later, if I'm in my, my room or my office on my PC, I should be able to play there. So I think this is a very important way of thinking about attracting users. Do not allow them the friction of different devices to get in the way of how they want to play. I think performance marketing is uh, huge. That's a whole topic unto itself. I've got only 15 minutes left. I'm just not even going to talk about that. I think you guys are the experts in it, or you should go find experts. I'm not going to cover it right now. And then the question of, of K-factor. You know, back when we started building games on Facebook, there was, for a very brief moment, you could release a game on Facebook and let everybody spam their friends and invite their friends to play the game, uh, and you got huge organics as a result. And that just doesn't happen anymore. First, because no one wants to let you spam their friends, and second, because, uh, because um, every game does that, right? So I think a big thing to think about is how do you get people who play your game and love your game to make sure that it's easy for them to tell their friends about it and have their friends download and join? We could talk a lot about that, but I want to talk about initial engagement. There's only one thing I really want you to think about, which is this. You have 10 seconds from the time that they start playing your game, and if you don't make them fall in love with you within 10 seconds, then you've lost them. They're gone. They don't care anymore because they can go to some other place, right? It really must be love at first sight. 
with these games, okay? And the only guidance I would give on that is to what we do, what I focus on for our games, Kabam, is using very simple inputs, touches, swipes, that's about it. No complicated stuff, yeah? Because within a few seconds, you need to be able to touch the screen and you need to feel powerful. You need to feel awesome. You need to feel competent and capable, all right? So make them fall in love with you right away. You could spend, if you spent half your energy making the first minute of your game amazing, you would be very satisfied with the results. Because if they don't fall in love with you in the first minute, they're never around for the rest of it. But after that, you have to reduce friction uh, in a huge way. I think there are a bunch of different things. We'll roll through them quickly. First, load times have to be small. Um, second, disk space. It cannot take up a bunch of space. You guys know this better than I do. I can't download a two gig APK. It's never going to get downloaded in the first place. People are going to delete it off their phones right away. No good. It's a friction point. Um, I should not allow needless choices. I'll give you a good example of this. Um, when a game first pops up, one of the worst things you can do, ask people to enter their name. Don't do that. Make them love you first. Get them pregnant with your game. Then ask them to make choices, right? People, it turns out, don't actually like choice. That causes friction. It causes internal stress. Don't make them commit quickly, right? This is another problem with entering a name. Don't make them give you their email address or sign in with WeChat right away. They don't want that. They don't love you yet. Get that out of the way. Make it later. Reduce complexity initially. And then give them a safe space to play in. Um, how many of you are amazing League of Legends players? Yeah, I'm not either, okay? And that game is an excellent case study in what it looks like to have social fear as a barrier. When you go into League of Legends for the first, I don't know, 500 times, you get brutally killed. You feel like an idiot, okay? People online tell you you're stupid. They say mean things to you, right? That level of social fear is very daunting to players. Get rid of it. Give people a, spa a safe space to experiment and then gradually introduce them to other more competitive modes. Okay, then initial engagement. This is maybe the most important thing I, I want to talk about is think about the fantasy that brought someone to this game. All right? There's a reason they downloaded it because they want to feel something. All right? And maybe they want to prove that they're powerful. They want to crush, kill, destroy. They want to shoot people and show that they're a badass. Okay, fine. Give them that. Um, maybe they want to demonstrate that they're clever. Maybe they want to create order from chaos by rearranging bricks or matching three or similar. Um, maybe they want to engage with some beloved hobby, like a, a cricket game, for example. Maybe they, they want to teach other people. Maybe they want to make friends. Maybe they want to have romance, um, et cetera. You, you get the point. But if you cannot articulate in a single, very short sentence what the fantasy that your game is fulfilling is, you shouldn't go make that game yet. You don't know what you're making yet. Think very carefully. I want to let you feel powerful. I want to let you shoot people. I want to let you play a fake guitar and be a rock star. Whatever. But it should be a very simple core fantasy. Okay. Long-term retention. You don't want games that people leave within a few hours or a few days or even a few weeks because ultimately you don't monetize off that, right? What you need in order to drive monetization, whether it's through advertising or through in-app purchases, the way you do this is by keeping people around forever. And the way you keep them around for a long time is through habituation, and social mechanics. Why do I play the games that I play every single day? Because my friends are all there, right? I'm missing out. I need to go log in to see what my friends are talking about, to make sure that they see if they need my help, and so forth. So social grouping is one of the most important things you can do for most types of games. And one of the things we've seen that's amazing over the last five years is how proper social grouping can be applied to almost any type of game. You need to allow people to make friends, invite friends we talked about. You need to allow them to make uh, alliances or social groups of some type, 10 or 30 people, that they have some common objectives with so that every single day they have some reason to come in and help each other out. 
Um, you want to give them leaderboards, obviously, so that they can compare each other, compare to how they do with other people in their region. You want to segment these leaderboards. Um, you want to give them short party groups that they can play with for just a few minutes. So in a case of a, of a pool game, my party group is the person I'm playing billiards with right this minute. Um, but maybe I've got a bunch of friends that hang out in this same virtual space that I can give gifts to. Maybe at Christmas I can send them new uh, pool cues or similar. But think about the types of social grouping that you're going to give people because if you give them a bunch of different ones and let them pick where they want to be engaged, then they will find so meaningful social interaction in your game and this will keep them coming back for months or years at a time as long as some of their friends are there. This is also critical to getting users to monetize and to spend a lot of time in your game. Social pressure, both positive and negative, is incredibly powerful. This gets them to log in regularly, and logging in on a regular basis every single day first, but really ideally every many times a day, this is the key to habituating behavior. And as soon as you habituate behavior, then you can predict how people are gonna do, all right? Uh, so one of the things that turns out to be true is someone who played uh, one of our games for the last seven days, they played every day, behaves fundamentally differently than someone who only played six of the last seven days. You are not habituated, right? Um, and it turns out that everything about their metrics is completely different. Once you get people, maybe I would think of it like a cup of coffee. Once you get the habit of waking up and having a cup of coffee every single morning, you know what? I know what you're gonna do tomorrow morning. You're gonna wake up and have a cup of coffee. So get your game to be a part of people's regular life, their daily life ritual and routine. This habituates use. And then you can get them then to log in all the time in order to advance to try and help their friends. You can get them to spend however much they're comfortable with. Maybe this is one rupee. Maybe this is $100. It, it, that, that differs. That has very little to do with your game, and it has to do with them just as the amount of money that a person is comfortable spending on a cup of coffee has to do with them. If I were to tell my grandfather that sometimes I buy a $5 cup of coffee at Starbucks in London, he would be horrified, okay? And he would be right to be horrified, but still I do that sometimes, okay? The same is true of in-app purchases. That in-app purchases, in my opinion, that in-app purchases are not incredibly popular everywhere yet, has most more to do with the price points at which you sell things than anything else. Do people buy things they like here? Of course they do, right? So then it's just a question of price. All right, social pressure can get people to spend money on your games because they don't want to let their friends down or because by spending a small amount of money, they can be seen as a hero to all their friends, right? It's very powerful. We could talk for an hour about this concept of Skinner boxes. How many of you guys know about Skinner boxes at all? All right, excellent. So a uh, very powerful way of motivating people. Turns out that uh, I'm not going to go into it. It had to do with how, how rats think. But anyway, the big point is uh, there are certain types of systems you can build into any game that will habituate the types of behaviors I'm talking about. Regular logins many times a day, checking in every single day. And if anybody wants to know more, just email me and we'll talk uh, more about it because it's a very interesting subject. Then, reacquisition. It turns out, no matter how great your game is, not everybody plays it forever. Life gets in the way. They have to do something else for a few days. Or they just get bored of your game and, and fall in love with a different game. Or they go fall in love with a real life human being who tells them, stop playing that game. So, but that's okay, because just because they don't pl didn't play it yesterday, doesn't mean they can't play it tomorrow. So one of the things you want to think about a lot is how to get people who have lapsed, who have left your game temporarily, to return. And the only real hard thing here is figuring out how to communicate with them. If you're lucky, they gave you their phone number or their email address or their WhatsApp login so you can send them a message. That's great if you, uh, if you were persuasive enough to get that out of them at some point then they're fairly easy to reacquire. If not, then you have to resort to other means, but you still probably know something about how that user came into your game through social media or similar, right? So reactivation often is much more effective than, than uh, going out and acquiring a brand new user. For any dollar you spend or any minute of your time you spend thinking about 
user acquisition, you should ask, would that same energy be better spent reacquiring a player or a customer who loved my game before? So don't forget about reaching out to and reacquiring users. Thank you, and thank you all for hanging out with me today. Thank you.